Thank you so much for coming out on this uh, cold and uh, wet morning, which is a reminder that even uh, we Californians sometimes have something to complain about when it comes to the weather. Um, I have the great uh, honor and privilege of introducing, oh, I should say, uh, I'm uh, Teku Lee, by the way. I'm the Associate Director of the Haas Institute and a professor here at Berkeley. And I've got the uh, great honor and privilege of introducing to you the 61st Mayor of New Orleans, the Honorable Mitchell Landrieu. Throughout his 30 plus years of public service, Mayor Landrieu has really been tenacious about improving lives, enhancing opportunities, securing justice for New Orleanians and Louisian Louisianans, um, governing by the philosophy of one team, one fight, one voice, and one city. Mayor Landrieu has been widely acclaimed for shepherding New Orleans through a remarkable post-Katrina economic recovery with strong job growth, unemployment below the national average, rising home values, new businesses and investments. And his many initiatives have been the driving force behind New Orleans' revitalization as one of the nation's fastest growing cities. He has also worked tirelessly to make his city safer, reducing its murder rate uh, dramatically down to its lowest rates in decades. And perhaps most relevant to our conference, Mayor Landrieu became a powerful force for good last May, not only by removing Confederate monuments in New Orleans, but also by giving the, mo the movement to topple these monuments a turbo boost of courage and moral conviction in a brilliant and impassioned public speech. And I encourage all of you to read and reflect uh, in full on this speech after the conference. But for now, I just wanted to share a sampling of its unflinching plea to make our own history that reflects our deepest values. Mayor Landry reminds us, and I quote here, these monuments purposefully celebrate a fictional sanitized confederacy, ignoring the death, ignoring the enslavement, and the terror that it actually stood for. They were erected purposefully to send a strong message to all who walked in their shadows about who was still in charge in this city. To literally put the Confederacy on a pedestal in our most important prominent places of honor is an inaccurate recitation of our full past. It is an affront to our present and it is a bad prescription for our future. We're in for a treat. Please show some love and extend your warmest West Coast welcome to the Honorable Mayor Mitch Landry. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And I thank all of you for braving uh, the rainy weather, but it is beautiful. A lot of people need rain, so it's a good thing. Uh, I wanna, of course, welcome my folks that are in Baltimore who I know are watching from uh, uh, across the way. And I want to thank the Haas Institute, the University of California, Berkeley, for inviting me to take part uh, in this important session. I know that you have had a number of good dates and some great speakers. My friend, one of my dearest friends, Sean Donovan, was here with you, and I know that did a great job. <clears throat> and I want to start uh, my conversation with you today with a very simple premise, which is let's start telling the truth. It's important because anything but the whole truth can lead us to a lie by omission. We have, in my opinion, never fully had a truthful conversation about our past in this country, specifically as it relates to race, that honors the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The good book says the truth shall set you free. The truth is that the words of our founding fathers that we hold so, so dear from quote unquote, all men are created equal to liberty and justice for all to e pluribus unum continue to ring hollow for some Americans today. I believe we can only go forward together towards a more perfect union and only if we're honest about our past and how we got here. So in preparing to come today, I recently went back and reviewed much of the Kerner Commission report and some of the literature around it. 
my dad was an elected official at the time. He was a city council member uh, in New Orleans. And I remember as I was growing up in his knee, talking to him about the riots uh, that were coursing through our community back in the 60s. And so I am in awe of the courage that it took the individuals that were on the current commission to tell the truth about that perilous time in our nation's history. The foresight it took to say what is and what was should be commended and remembered. And I know that you're doing that today. Now, despite the ground being fertile for change with the riots and the bipartisan support for addressing some of the inequities holding us back, the political environment in the 60s made it tough to have honest conversations about the injustice that was rooted in our society. We're talking race, community relations, and equity in the midst of a very divisive presidential election. Despite the impending difficulties, the Kerner Commission brought in an inconvenient truth to the forefront in the 1968 conversation. The senior statement and one state's woman put their careers and their legacies on the line to publish this report, a remarkable feat. Still 50 years later, these truths too often remain controversial and denied. There's an article that somebody in here might have writ, wrote into the New York Times today that sets out in stark detail how far we have come and still how far we have to go. And in some instances, we've actually reversed our trend. The current commission challenged the nation to admit that racism had in fact been institutionalized in America and had become a driving force and cornerstone for inequality. The commission acknowledged that American institutions were separating us into two societies which would only keep us apart, but would also continue to cause greater stratification and yes, worsen the outcomes for African Americans. Now, none of these ideas was new. This underlying message had been spoken by advocates and activists for decades. No doubt these commissioners felt the heavy burden of leadership as they discovered more and more evidence that institutional racism, intentional or unintentional, was the underlying cause of unrest that was sweeping America. I personally know this feeling all too well. The moment when a white politician finally understands what institutional racism looks like the commission, like the commission, as mayor of New Orleans, I was faced with a truth that I could not ignore, a truth that on some level I had known for a very long time, but never fully or deeply explored. As many of you know, I led New Orleans in a robust public process to remove four Confederate monuments that were erected in prominent public spaces. Thank you. By something that was called the cult of the lost cause. After exhaustive personal research, the historical record became clear to me. The monuments were erected well after the Civil War to rewrite history, to hide the truth. And the truth is that the Confederacy was not just on the wrong side of the war to destroy the United States, but also humanity. These statutes were erected to send a strong reminder to all who walked in their shadows that despite the fact that the United States won that war, the Confederacy was still in charge of our city, and indeed, the South. The propaganda of the Lost Cause adherents were peddling was not just a benign myth. It was a lie that distorted history. It sought to rationalize lynchings and create a second class of citizenship for African Americans. These symbols were in fact intended to send a specific message to African Americans, and I firmly believe that they had a link to the systems and the institutions that we continue to work towards addressing today. Most importantly, these particular statutes do not represent history. They are a perversion of it. They are an affront to it. I knew this sanitizing of history must end, and I did what I could, which was to work with our city council to remove them. We all have to keep pushing. To take down these statutes, we followed a two-year democratic process filled with public hearings, approval from three separate lead commissions, and a 6-1 vote by the New Orleans City Council. Of course, those who wanted to keep the monuments up sued us, which prolonged the process, increased the cost, and ultimately attempted to subvert the will of the people. This should sound familiar. After 13 different federal and state judges heard the case, and yes, justice may have been delayed, but this time justice would not be denied. But even after that arduous process, even after the courts deemed it legal to take down the monuments, 
I actually had to get it done. And I needed a crane. The first contractor we had pulled out of the job after receiving death threats and having his car blown up. Now literally, I want you to think about this, a firebombing in 2015, in the 15th year of the 21st century, and here Brown versus Board with all deliberate speed, as though it was gonna happen immediately. Still, I thought, no worries, because not only were we building a new airport, construction was booming all over the city and cranes were everywhere because we were completely rebuilding a great American city. New schools, new airports, new riverfronts, cranes across the sky. But not one company would take the job. Underlying institutional racism influenced city business interests and the state, causing companies to fear being on the right side of history, even when they would get paid for their labor. Every African-American-owned business, even African-American-owned businesses, feared being cut out by their white counterparts. So we had to move heaven and earth, literally, to bring a crane from outside of the state, which we did. In that very small experience, I finally learned what so many African-Americans know all too well. Even when you have the law on your side, if someone else controls the money, the machines, the hardware that you need to make your new law work, you are screwed. Even when I, as the mayor of one of the greatest rebuilds in the country, needed a crane, I couldn't get one. The speech I gave to the people of New Orleans as we were taking down Robert E. Lee was titled The Truth. Because while it was an important moment in moving us forward, we have never really reckoned with our past. And that was the point. So the current commission was bold when it named institutional racism and the incredible depth of inequality and racial disparity as the underlying cause for civil unrest in the country. It just simply stated the truism that where there is no justice, there can be no peace. That is not a threat. It's an actual statement of fact, because where there is no justice, there is an alienation. And when people are in alienation, we cannot be at peace. It was bold when it advocated for the immediate hiring of two million people, either directly by the government or the private industry. It was bold when it recommended the immediate construction of 600,000 new housing units and a basic minimum income. It was bold when it said that these initiatives should be paid for with new revenue, recognizing the very simple truth that you cannot pay for something with nothing. It was an endorsement of a new Marshall Plan to invest in our own cities and our own people. This, my friends, was true courage. As you can imagine, this courage wasn't met with overwhelming praise by the establishments. Most whites rejected the claim that racism was to blame. It was a truth that we could not face. Richard Nixon, who would win the November 1968 presidential election a few months later, stated that everybody blames everybody for the riots except the perpetrators of the riots. He said that if the rioting happened during his presidency, he would meet force with force. And he used it as a foil throughout his campaign to stoke fear. Doesn't this sound familiar to all of us today? A commander in chief who couldn't see, nonetheless tell the truth, if it was right in front of his face. Now even LBJ, the president who commissioned the report, and is rightly hailed as a hero for what he accomplished for the civil rights and for the poor in America, rejected the report largely out of fear for how it would be received by the white middle class in America. This shows just how difficult it was to speak the truth about race in the 1960s. This process of truth telling and action or inaction is even more evident today. Most notable for us right now in the debate over gun violence in the wake of the mass shootings in Parkland at Stoneman Douglas High School and the day-to-day -day carnage that we see on the streets of America. The debate over guns is not new. Polls show that most people in America recognize that there are common sense solutions, responsible gun ownership that we can enact to keep guns out of the hands of those who want to hurt themselves or other people. Models for a comprehensive approach to reducing violent crime already exist in America. Mayors who deal with this issue in their communities are eager to push beyond the partisan and the political roadblocks that stall their ability to help find solutions to reduce, to reduce gun violence on our streets. In 2017, the U.S. Conference of Mayors adopted an agenda that talked about comprehensive and responsible gun ownership, and you have seen and heard the list. The president had a meeting yesterday that was hopeful and open. We've seen those before. We hope Congress gets to work and does their job so that we can protect 
the people of America. The truth is that we do not have deficits of ideas in this country. We have deficits of courage. We need a courageous Congress and White House that is willing to act. In New Orleans, we've been working on this every day in my administration. We launched NOLA for Life, a comprehensive murder reduction strategy. It focuses on prevention, intervention, enforcement, rehabilitation, job training. It recognizes violence as a public health threat just as well as a public safety threat. So while Washington talks about background checks or age limits or mental health, the rest of us are still waiting for them to act. Every community in America feels the pain of Washington's lack of courage, but is especially painful in my city of New Orleans. In my town, we remember Brianna Allen, five years old, killed. We remember the day as one of the worst days in the city. Five-year-old child on the front porch at her cousin's birthday when she was brutally murdered because a bunch of knuckleheads wanted to kill her father with an assault rifle. And they hit her instead. Mass shootings and violent crime every day tear apart too many communities. and It is becoming too common to hear stories of kids like Brianna or those at Sandy Hook and now Stoneman Douglas High School who find themselves in the crosshairs of assault rifles in the possession of those who never should have had them in the first place. If it is true, and I believe it is, that every human being can make a difference in their lives, it has to also be true that the absence of human beings makes a difference in our lives. And when you add up the carnage in America since 1980, we've had over 630,000 American citizens killed on the streets of America in all of the iterations of violence that we're talking about now. That's more American soldiers that were killed in all of the wars of the 20th century. That's a statistic that's worth thinking a bit about. When people who feel neglected make bad decisions and have access to weapons of war, too many times in this country, innocent people lose their lives. And a piece of everyone's future is needlessly lost. Before the Parkland mass shooting, the president's solution to keeping our nation safe was to use immigrants as a scapegoat. He proposed a $25 billion on a new border wall while also proposing cuts at the same time to local law enforcement agency, homeland security, and real violence reduction strategies that are empirically verified to work. About half of that money could be spent on hiring new police officers who are engaged in true community policing, new investments in homeland security, criminal justice reform that is so really needed and long overdue, mental health treatment, better technology, and substance abuse treatment. This is not an exclusive list. There are many more things we can do to this, but right now, Congress prohibits the Center for Disease Control from doing research on what approaches to dealing with public health would actually work. For America to be great, our leaders have to find a way to come together and find solutions that will make us safer and stronger. And of course, we're here today because the Kerner Commission report is a stark reminder that now more than ever, America needs courageous leaders again to tackle issues like race, economic equity, education, affordable housing, criminal justice reform, immigration, climate change, it's real, and gun violence. We need leaders who see public service as a calling and a vocation. We need leaders whose political philosophy is tied to a greater ethos that's rooted in sacrifice. We need leaders who can discern when they must do the hard things for the sake of doing what is just and right. And we need leaders who will face the truth and then lead us on a new pathway forward. When we face great challenge and uncertainty in this country, from the Women's March to Black Lives Matter to the Me Too movement, and to the amazing students at Stoneman Douglas High, young people like the ones in this room that attend this university, that are attending this Respect for the Commission report, are the ones that give me hope and confidence. From my vantage point, you are the future. You are our hope. And my question to you is which one of you will step forward to lead us to a better day. My prayer is that together we will stay committed to the hard work of courageous leadership to improve lives, strengthen our communities, and solve real problems that prevent too many of our fellow citizens from reaching their full potential. The one thing we know from this work is that the road is long and arduous. There are ups and downs. There is a great Haitian proverb that says, beyond every mountain, there is another mountain. 
Dr. King said, has been quoted by President Obama so many times, that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. I know that some of you are doubting that right now. I believe it to be true. So I say amen to that. But I finally say this, that arc of justice does not bend on its own. Somebody's got to do the bending. So we have to get out there every day and keep working for that more perfect union, one that we took for granted will continue to move in the right direction. But now you know that is not true. And that is because ideas transcend time, good ones and bad ones. And it's up to us to make sure that we pick the good ones. Thank you all so very much. We have 10 minutes for questions and answers from Baltimore and from here. I want to say only 10 minutes, so I'm going to ask people who come to the mic to spend only 30 seconds in getting out your question or your comment so that we can get as many uh, people interacting with the mayor as possible. I just want to say to the mayor, I really appreciate what you've done in New Orleans. I was happened to be in New Orleans at the time the statues were coming in. I was there for Jazz Fest. Wow. And it was a very exciting time. My cousins were excited. Uh, people in the community were excited. And uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. So with that said, let's go to Baltimore. I'm going to take two questions from Baltimore and then come back here to Berkeley. Uh, again, 30 seconds. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you here. I am a New Orleanian. I see that. Yeah. Um, they don't know that. that's a baby cake hat? Yeah, it's just a New Orleans baseball hat. <laughs> Um, I want to add something to the conversation, uh, no question really, um, but just in the interest of truth to which you spoke at the beginning of your remarks, um, I want to add to uh, the context for the removal of the Confederate monuments in New Orleans. And Mr. Mayor, I really applaud you for your leadership and fortitude in dealing with like the true insanity. Uh, at the same time uh, that your leadership was actually built on the uh, years long efforts of black led organizing in the city. Uh, take them down okay, NOLA as the organization to, to look up. forward, but uh, thank you for building on their leadership and uh, supporting their good work. Thank you. All right. Let me respond to that. Go ahead. First of all, I have a, I've written a book on this, which is coming out um, next week, and there is extensive attribution given to not only um, take them down NOLA, but to the, all of the activists that have worked for the past hundred years. Uh, to get these down. I certainly wasn't the first one that thought about this, never did it on my own, uh, and of course wouldn't have been able to accomplish it without the help of all of those who went before me. So thank you for reminding everybody. Thank you. Go ahead. Next person. A, we got somebody over here at this mic. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, Thomas Silverstein. I'm with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights in Washington, D.C. I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on what uh, cities and advocates can do to fight the threat of state preemption of progressive local change, which I know has been a big issue and a threat sort of around the country through efforts supported by ALEC, in, including in Louisiana, where I know there was a failed uh, bill, thankfully, that failed to preempt inclusionary zoning in New Orleans and sort of connects to the monument issue as well, because I, I got know in Virginia. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Question is, what, what, do you, what can you do to stop state preemption of issues when red states think blue states are doing bad things. You have the reverse in California, where a blue state might want to stop a, a, another red city from doing whatever they want. Generally, as the mayor, especially in home rule charter cities, we like to say that our people know what they want, and, and, and anybody preempting what we do is really kind of stifling democracy across the board. Secondly, you'll notice in the federal system that we have that elections matter. So the most important thing you do is get people elected to office that think the way you think. And if everybody doesn't show up to vote, you got a real problem. Now, voter suppression, all of, uh, voter, adding voters to the role, all very important. But the most thing is we got to show up. There's only one thing that's in between you and what you want the federal government to do, and that's an election in November. Now, I want you to think about what I just said. There's an election coming up in November that will completely change the course of American history if the Democrats take back the House or take back the Senate. So whatever side of the aisle people are on, Politically, elections matter. Once elections are done and the American people have spoken, 
the people in office will exercise the power that they have to accomplish the things that they want. And now that you have a Congress and a president and a Senate and a Supreme Court that are in the hands of one party, they will exercise whatever authority they can on the federal level, state level, and local level to enact their policies. So elections really, really matter. Absent that, there's not much you can do legally to stop the democratic process from happening rather than to be present, be active, and to win. Okay. Uh, can we go to Baltimore? Baltimore, do you have two questioners? Good morning, uh, my name is Maria Nayas and I'm from Independent Sector. What latent opportunities do you see for the millennial generation and this upcoming Generation Z that we can also um, just try to move forward towards did you, action? Did you say legal? Millennials. Oh, millennials. I, I would, listen, the, what you see today politically is the result of a lot of grassroots work that was done by people who think differently from many people in this room. And I think folks have gone to sleep. That's why in my neighborhood you say you need to stay woke. And I think now people see the consequence in stark terms that elections really do matter. So there are a lot of things that young people can do. First, in my question at the end of it, says, who is going to step up to lead? Now, you don't have to be an elected official to lead. You don't have to be the mayor of the city. You don't have to be the president of the United States. You don't have to be a governor. There are many, many ways for you to lead, and one of them is day to day in your communities, talking about the issues that matter, finding good empirical data to support, go convince other people of the rightness of your position. You see now, I think, at least in the last week, with this terrible tragedy in Parkland, that people on both sides of the aisle are starting to open up to, we really now have to get something done. Sometimes things take 50 or 60 years. The current commission report is an exact point that back in the day when the truth was known, it took us 50 years to process that. When Brown versus Board of Education were put in place, it took 30 or 40 years to make that happen. Nothing is gonna happen quick, and certainly nothing will happen if nobody puts their shoulder to the wheel. So this may be uh, an unwelcome admonition, but it's get to work. Keep working, keep moving, one foot in front of the other because freedom isn't free. It's gotta be earned every day and we have to stand on the shoulders that went before us and continue to do the right thing. If you keep doing that every day, you will break the wall down or stop one from being built in the first place. Yes, okay, another questioner from Baltimore, 30 seconds. Last one, I got it. Okay. What is the secret to your remarkable achievements in the New Orleans school system? Well, I only have two minutes to answer that question. <laughs> but, it's, but it is fairly simple. When, when New Orleans was, for the most part, destroyed by Katrina, we lost everything. I mean, all the schools were gone. Everything was gone. Miraculously, the people of New Orleans, who had allowed themselves to be suspended in pain, which is an amazing thing, you understand, if you have something awful that happens, all you want to do is get back to where you were before, close your eyes, and act like it didn't happen. The people of New Orleans made a decision not to build it back the way it was, but to build it back the way it should have been if we would have gotten it right the first time. So rebuilding our system was not without controversy, but it is something that we decided collectively when we were in pain to do the hard thing. So we have 33 brand new schools, state-of-the-art learning centers with technology that's as nice as any school in America. Our dropout rates are down, our graduation rates are up, and here's a wonderful thing about it. The achievement gap has been closed between my kids in the city that they said couldn't learn and the kids outside of the city. That's the good part. The bad part for people who are traditional public school advocates is it's a 100% charter system. So we took the middle road. We left vouchers alone. We have still public uh, and believe in public education, but the charters are public and they have parents. And what we found was that where you have appropriate investments from the public in schools, where you have great principals, you give the principals the freedom to hire and work with the greatest teaching staff that he or she can find. Parents have some investment or responsibility in their kids, and then you have high expectations of their children and give them a surf learning environment. Whatever structure you have them in, public, kind of quasi-public or private, kids are gonna learn. And we made their futures the most important thing to us in the city. Now, the question for the country is why we have to wait for a catastrophe to occur to do something meaningful around immigration reform, transportation, public safety, or education. And the challenge for us in the country is not to wait until there's a cataclysmic event that shocks us in to focus. Because at the end of the day, 
We need to keep getting better every day, one step at a time. My time is up. I thank you for being so gracious and so welcoming to me. To my friends in Baltimore, I hope to see you soon, and uh, God bless all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on.